No, you know, it's, if I was going to invest money in, in one place, it's building the house right. I mean, we had the state senator in the last group, and my comment was, you know, what can we do at the Nebraska level? Update our building codes. That's the one single thing I think that's going to have a true long-term impact. There is a huge difference between lease cost and lease price. They don't consider externalities. They don't consider those costs to uh, the people who are contracting diseases uh, based on, as, as identified by the George W. Bush White House, um, that are associated with coal-fired power plants. Mm -hmm. We aren't including mm. those costs, and we aren't talking to the people of Nebraska about their responsibility. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's like cheating the other guys so, and passing the savings on to you. Um, you know, and if we were to five dollar gas as a farmer, a local farmer, five dollar gas would help me. Help you change? Yeah, it helped me compete. See, I, all and veggies and stuff from California or Mexico. Uh, I, I think it would help. You know, the local regional food system. That, so, saving energy. A lot of energy can be saved for less than three cents a kilowatt hour. Nobody produces power that cheaply, but you can save it that cheaply. So we need to do more of that. When energy prices went up, including natural gas and gasoline, I, it hurt a little bit, but not compared to what my friends were saying, who were having to fill their tank every single day or every few days because they had long commutes. I still had to pay a lot to fill my tank, but I didn't fill my tank as often. And then they had to kind of react and adjust their behaviors, whereas I think if we could somehow be proactive, to me, the, the rising cost of energy is inevitable. And if we're not proactive, it's going to slam us upside the head. Well, they find that most of the problems are chronic diseases by choice. And most of it is obesity. So, I mean, we have to start educating our children how to eat properly, not providing them fast food for lunch every day. I'd like to add, the community garden movement is uh, not so much as putting, putting uh, gardens in communities, it's building communities out of gardens. And it makes for safer neighborhoods, and people get to know their people across the, uh, the street from them, not unlike people that have ever lived in an apartment. Uh, don't know the people down the hall, but uh, it, it brings those folks together. Uh, but it also is the really the most viable routine for community education on uh, food. I can't buy from my farmer unless I go to their farm. I can't buy it at a farmer's market or in a grocery store, okay, because somebody decided that they need to protect me. Now I can go to a liquor store and buy any, you know, 100 million kinds of liquors, but I can't go buy milk straight from a cow because it's against the law. So I, I just, I would prefer the government not decide what our values are. And like you said, individually people need to decide what the values are, but let's make a, a level playing field for everybody to make those decisions. You know? I think that the, the, the decisions are, are, should be made from scientists and people that actually have the people in mind. And, rather than the corporations who they want to you know, continue using the same methods that they've been using for 30 years that have been deregulated. So, soapbox off. <laughs> well, a system that isn't in place now that would be an alternative is to have the grocery stores set up a model that supports local farming versus nationwide farming. Of course, we all love to have the fruits all year round, but Maybe that's not the smartest way to live. Maybe it is better to go back to the canning. decision made by a lot of people who govern the country that one of the primary goals of a food production policy is to keep stable, cheap food at the retail counter. So that's why shoppers for six... At the same time, we've got this growing movement toward locally grown organic. We've also got, at least I believe, an emerging concern about the impact with the, the unknown impact of genetically modified seed stock. Right. And that seems to just be growing, you know, the recent decision on alfalfa and, mm -hmm. and, and the potential impact on people who choose to farm organic. Um, 
Less than 50% of families are the traditional two parents and two kids type families. And, and so I think the different demographics will drive new trends in housing that are more dense. And then also we've got a call in our plan for public transportation, a true uh, system of public transportation that provides more choices than we've ever had. Great point too about your mixing mixing societies. I always talk about what's what kind of the what's the best soil. It's it's a, a soil that's essentially a lot of different particle sizes. Okay, not all one size. Okay, <laughs> it's all it's strong. So you want a well graded thing, one graded populations, different kinds of people, ethnic ethnicity. Uh, ages, eco economics. I think we need these green spaces. I mean, if we're focusing, you know, if they're, you know, like Omaha is landlocked with all the surrounding areas and we're focusing on growing, you know, from the inside out, what about these green spaces? Are, are we going to accept, well, I mean. It takes a lot of policy work and a lot of political will, but you can create them. There's also green groups and those things. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have valuation in the district you want to improve. You have to have property owners willing to pay extra for improvements. And generally, not always, but in a lot of cases, if, if, if an area deteriorates, ownership starts at the, a lot of that deterioration starts at the individual property level. One person lets the broker. So I think what we really need is a vision with a plan. I think we, we can't start with policy because policy can be kind of all over. I think we have to start with a vision and work back from there to figure out what that policy would be to get to that vision. And I think that we've all talked about, you know, what that vision would be. But if we just start policy here, policy there, okay. Because I'm the one in the shop using this material, and if you open up any can of paint or any of the adhesives I was using, it says right there, it will cause brain damage. You will die. <laughs> and so that's what really led me to this. But educating the client and hoping that they'll jump on board with this. It helps me, but then I can also sell the value to them that it helps them. Yeah, it costs more right now. So the, from, from my perspective, the conservation piece is the simplest, right? I don't spend it, that's cheaper. But when I have to buy it and the green alternative is 15, 20% higher, that's not sustainable, back to that big question of sustainability. My, my design business model is healthy, safe, affordable, and beautifully functional interior design. Um, make a lot of compromises when it comes down to affordable. A lot of times it means reusing the existing products that are already in the home. Or consumers to know how to cut out marketing hype versus good information about these sustainable practices or this, you know, what's just a fad right now or what one company is trying to market to give them an edge in their industry versus what is actually good, sound information. How do you equip people with that tool set to figure that out? I provide uh, product data sheets of the materials, the, you know, the adhesive, whatever, the finish. Um, so they can look at it and make that decision if they have questions. Yeah, you do that, but but they'll pull it out and then, then you all use the, the certified respectable recyclers and they have to recycle the product. So that's kind of a new trend if you're, if you're aware of that. I got who and who works? Everybody works for different companies here or nonprofits. Who has a susta per, uh, sustainable purchasing policy at their group? Or who even knows? Because um, it's it's a, again it's about that bottom line. We need more data about why. The environment is is cost effective, or you know, environmental practices are cost effective, and I don't think we have. I mean, I would love to see organizations like this really focus on building data around those types of things. <laughs> I think it's a huge issue that you would have to pay extra. I know at home we don't recycle because my roommates won't pay for that. <laughs> so I think if it were a service offered along with trash that we already pay for. Um, it would be a lot more likely for everyone to participate. Because it costs more and because it's not convenient, they're not participating. We have an obligation to make it easy for Allie to recycle because she's going to do it. She's going to do it. One of the great benefits to good corn prices right now is agricultural operators are able to put in more center pivots. 
and center pivots use a third of the water that the old-fashioned gravity flow that used to erode and waste a lot of water just out the tail end of the soil field. Problem. And soil, yeah, it, it just you can put center side. pivots on areas that you can't do gravity irrigation. I'm a recovered farmer exactly, myself yeah. from, <laughs> from, from southwest Nebraska. Right, so in a lot of places he's right. You're now, now we're irrigating places that we didn't irrigate right. before. So there's more wells. So, Part of yeah. the problem in southwest Nebraska was that they started to put the, the, the uh, put out notice that they were going to have moratoriums in a couple years and so the well drillers uh, started drilling wells in advance so you, and to have a real conservation approach to water and pricing you have to we have to figure out a way to go to uh, ratepayers and say you have to now start paying the full cost of what the, of the water because right now we're subsidizing in a lot of ways the the infrastructure the the, the whole system is not ultimately sustainable on the kind of cost basis that we have now and even the big new water line that was just put in from Ashland to Lincoln costing I think 60 million dollars. You know, those are those are internal skirmishes that don't have to be important if we look at the entire amount and try and work together to systematically solve our problems. Understanding the difference between use and consumption is is tremendously important because when you use water it remains available as one of the presenters earlier said it remains available in your area if you consume it it's gone. So I don't have a good answer how we get more education, but to the policymakers and to both the sellers and the buyers of the water, we've got to help them to understand sustainability and understand the quality of it, or we're not going to get very far with policymakers.